Hello everyone and welcome uh, to the event this evening. My name is Matt. I'm a current research assistant in the Public Law and Law in Wales team. Thank you very much for joining. We're really glad to have you here uh, this afternoon. If you have any questions during the event, please feel free to post them uh, in the Q&A. We'll do our best to answer as many as, as we can at the end uh, of the presentation. Uh, I've, we've got members, uh, research assistants from all different teams joining us today, and we've also got lawyers to explain the application process and to give you some uh, top tips. But first, before uh, all of that, I'd like to introduce the chair of the Law Commission, Sir Nicholas Green, who is going to give us a, an introduction and I'll hand over to him now. Thanks very much indeed. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's very good to be speaking to you today. I've got five minutes, which is very short, so I'm going to be reasonably quick. Uh, so welcome to the Law Commission. Uh, I'm Nick Green. I'm the chair of the Law Commission and I'm also a judge in the Court of Appeal. Uh, I sit in court about one week in four and the rest of the time uh, I am devoted to Law Commission business. Uh, I think I've got one of the most interesting jobs in the entirety of the judiciary. The Law Commission's a small organisation. We have about 65 lawyers and researchers, but yet we are actually at the very heart of government and Westminster. Uh, at any one time, we've got over 20 law reform projects which are ongoing. And at the moment, we cover a huge range of different um, subjects um, from crime relating to the Internet, hate crime, for example, weddings, surrogacy, planning law in Wales, the law relating to robot cars, automated vehicles, and the whole of the digital economy, a massive subject. A recent International Chamber of Commerce report estimated that if our work on that area uh, came to fruition, it would assist in opening up an international market worth trillions of dollars. Our work does really matter. Uh, we did some analysis a couple of years ago evaluating the impact of what we did. We took about 10 projects that we had worked on between 2010 and 2020 and we instructed two economists to conduct an analysis of the cost and the benefit of that work. They made an assessment which was that those 10 projects, which were not the total number of projects, of course, that we were working on during that period, but those 10 projects had a positive effect upon the lives of over 27 million people. Three of those projects were assessed as generating an economic benefit of, of over three billion pounds over a course of 10 years. So for such a small group, we punch above our weight. We're grappling with some of the most difficult and sensitive issues of the day. For example, we've nearly completed our report on hate crime. Over two and a half thousand people responded to that consultation paper. We have to try and strike a balance between those who believe passionately in free speech and those who also believe passionately that individuals and particularly the most vulnerable in our society need protection from what goes on in the media and social media. I can tell you that striking a balance and working out where the evidence that's submitted to us leads us is an extremely difficult task indeed. Now, as you know, each year we take on a group of about 18 RAs. Uh, speaking personally, I, I always enjoy meeting and working with uh, the research assistants. They are an incredibly bright and interesting and diverse bunch. They work in teams on a variety of different issues, and I know others will be telling you about what they do very shortly. So let me uh, finish by saying that our RAs become closely involved in the entirety of the work of the Commission. You work closely with your lawyers, with the, t the heads of the various uh, teams, and indeed with the commissioners. And I come across the RAs on a regular basis. It's a fantastic opportunity. I'm delighted so many of you have logged on this afternoon to learn all about us and are now passed back to those who are going to take this afternoon forward. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. And so I'm going to talk a bit more uh, about the Law Commission and who we are. 
The Law Commission is a statutory body. We were established in 1965. Uh, that's the act there on the screen. And in the act, it says exactly uh, what we do. We're for the purpose of promoting reform of the law of England and Wales. And our aim is to ensure the law is fair, modern, simple and cost effective. Uh, we're a non-departmental public body. And what that means is that we're not uh, associated with any particular government department. We're sponsored by the Ministry of Justice, uh, but the other, my colleagues will explain later how we take on projects. We're independent and that means that the government really do listen to us and we have quite an influence uh, in Whitehall. Our jurisdiction is England and Wales. And that means we advise the UK and the Welsh governments and we also work closely with the Welsh Advisory Committee. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Diana and I'm a research assistant in the commercial and common law team at the Law Commission. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the office. Um, so at the moment our working pattern is quite flexible, but physically the Law Commission is located on the first floor in the Ministry of Justice building, uh, which is where I am right now, actually. Uh, it's right across the street from St James's Park station in central London. It's also very close to St James's Park, which you will see here on the slide, which is a favourite lunch spot of the RAs. Um, and this is the organisational structure of the Law Commission. And as you can see, research assistants report to lawyers. Um, mostly uh, you will work closely with one lawyer on one project throughout your time at the Law Commission. And then the lawyers uh, report to commissioners. There is one commissioner for each of the teams. And then everyone reports to the chairperson who is uh, Law Justice Green, who you've heard from. Uh, and there are also team managers for each individual team. On the other hand, we have the executive side of the Law Commission, which is um, chaired by the uh, CEO, Phil Golding, and there are also non-executive board members. Um, and there is a corporate services team, which ensures that everything on the organisational and administrative side runs smoothly at the Law Commission. And we've got an economic advisor as well. And then there's also the Parliamentary Council who prepares draft legislation on the basis of our recommendations to be sent to Parliament. Bye. Are, you, are you okay to talk about how we select projects? Sorry. Um, sorry. I am Abhaya. I am one of the research assistants in the criminal law team. And so how we select the projects that we work on at the Law Commission, there are two main sources for how we do that. The first is um, the core programme that we have. Uh, so the last, the 13th Law Reform project from which most of our projects that we're currently working on stem from. Uh, was agreed upon in 2016 and this year we're currently just working on the 14th law reform project and deciding which projects to go forward with this year uh, and another way that we get our projects is departmental references that is um, issues from particular interest of government or governmental departments so when uh, particular government departments whether it's the ministry of justice or um, uh, or the office of leveling up they when there is a particular area of law that requires like further research and wider scale um, consultation and analysis, they uh, we get direct terms of reference from the government. So uh, how we select these projects, uh, the criteria has been agreed upon with the Lord Chancellor. Uh, so the criteria that you can see on the slide right now, there is importance, um, important suitability resources and departmental support they each uh, bring something different in how we consider it so the first in terms of importance i guess we look at things like um, 
when we look at things like whether uh, the impact that it would create in the sense how necessary law is, how unduly, let's say, complex or inconsistent or outdated the law is, uh, for which there needs to be, uh, you know, a large scale consultation and, uh, you know, there has to be reforms. So that and so those are some of the criteria that we consider. Others in terms of suitability, let's say, for example, so Law Commission is the independent body has resources and is employ and employs lawyers and commissioners which have the capacity to take on wider scale reforms. So, for example, if there was a particular section of, let's say, the Criminal Justice Act, which just needed reform, someone thought that, you know, there's um, something wrong in the way that it's worded or it leaves out a category that's, you know, inadvertent, we didn't meet the, you know, we just sort of uh, was an oversight, then that's something that would go directly to, let's say, Ministry of Justice because um, because, well, they're not an independent body and they have more um, authority to just change that one reform. However, we need sort of a wider scale, uh, a wider scale reform. For example, um, what we've considered in terms of adult social care previously or electoral laws. So uh, those kinds of where there needs to be stakeholder analysis before any reform is proposed that would come to us in terms of suitability. So again, in terms of um, resources and departmental support, these are considerations that would be well, pretty high level considerations in a sense. It would depend on the department itself and for commissioners and for the core uh, and for the core team to decide on uh, on how this goes about. So for, for example, resources, because we're an independent body and we get our resources through the Ministry of Justice, it will be about uh, with each separate project. If we've got it from a particular department, we also need to agree on where funding comes from for them, for example. Um, so these are some of the concerns on how we select projects at the law com. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jessica Guccioni and I work uh, in the public law team. Um, I'm actually working with Matt, uh, who's our chief presenter today. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to speak with you all. Um, so the 14th programme of law reform, it's not the uh, clearest title. What it does is it gives us the body of work that the Law Commission will be doing for the next three to four years. Uh, we periodically have a big refresh about what work the Law Commission will be doing and we consult on it. We're a very consultative organisation um, and so we uh, conduct periodically a, a big um, consultation event to figure out what work we ought to be doing and that body of work then gets approved by the Lord Chancellor and you know the teams can get cracking on it. Um, so we did just such a, a consultation in 2021 and we received over 500 responses um, from different organisations, individuals, like a real mix um, of different people from academia as well as just people responding in their own private capacity, for example. Um, and the idea is that we will then use those suggestions um, to help us, as I was mentioning, um, determine what you know the work we ought to be doing, fitting the uh, criteria that Abaya just told us earlier, uh, you know, if the work is suitable, important enough, um, and basically means that we can do a good job and a useful um, job on it. So the idea would be that um, if you apply and you get taken on, you would be allocated to a project that is part of this big uh, program of work. So our previous program, which is just ending now, so our 13th program, um, had about two thirds of um, its content deriving from public consultation um, and about a third of it came from direct references from different departments uh, that told us that they had an issue or a problem with a particular area and so we jumped in and uh, dealt with it and responded to it. So uh, working at the Commission would mean that you would have uh, the opportunity uh, to participate and contribute to delivering uh, this work program. Um, over to you. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, so the stages of the project uh, coming on from after we've decided that after we've decided in terms of reference in the project, so we'd be going forward with. 
um, either like I explained before, either from departments or from the uh, core program itself. So the initiation would basically be just that, that is agreeing in terms of reference, discussing within the team and conducting initial research to see what issues are pertinent to the, you know, to the terms of reference, the, uh, the subjects that are being raised and see that we all, uh, the core team, um, are alive to all of the issues and perspectives. And then with that, do research on uh, priority stakeholders, which brings me to the second point, which is the um, pre-consultation process. So here, I guess we initially meet with priority stakeholders. So for example, um, depending on the project, let's say it's very procedural, that your priority stakeholders might be uh, magistrates, um, judges, barristers, solicitors, um, you know, people more on the field. It might be the Criminal Bar Association, the Bar Council, those kinds of people. So you meet with them initially again to further the research you've done to see that you've taken on board all of the important issues in the beginning. So from here, you would move on to consultation. So, uh, so in the pre-consultation stage and consultation stage as an RA, um, currently I work on these two stages. So my job is to do, let's say, like stakeholder management that I do research, come up with who the priority stakeholders are. I set up meetings, symposiums, if that's what we want, roundtables, focus groups, depending on the type of projects, like if there are in criminal law, if I want victims to reach out to us, then we try and come up with focus groups or online uh, online events where they can keep their anonymity. So these are the things we do in these two stages. So after consultation, we put out an interim report. That is, it has our um, interim proposals that are preliminary proposals saying this is after initial consultation. This is what we think. And then there's a period of consultation. It could be about three months, depending on the project, but that I would say is the average where we put out these our proposals and our basic research and what we've uh, gathered from our stakeholders and we get public responses uh, we, uh, and then using these responses to our proposals uh, and, you know, through other evaluation, we then go towards policy development. This is a stage at which everybody's throwing around ideas where even when you're an RA, you're very, very welcome to give your opinion. There have been, a, uh, you know, some projects where RAs have been given chapters to draft themselves. So what you get to do varies on the stage of the project that you're at and it also varies on the type of project because sometimes your project might be more, um, uh, might be more, research heavy, other times it might be more consultation heavy where you actually go out and meet stakeholders. So all of these things feed into what your role might be. So sometimes it might be admin work, sometimes you might be drafting whole chapters and telling us exactly what you think it might end up in the final report. So at final report stage is where you're um, basically going out and publishing your final findings. So along with this come a lot of uh, management of let's say the publicity the comms uh, the communications team help out here so it could be through press releases and other ways through which you try to publicize um your your recommendations and um after this the stages after this depend on whether government choose to take forward our recommendations um and then uh, yes that's the stages of the project here at the law com hi everybody I'm hi everybody. I'm Matthew. I'm one of the lawyers um, who is working at the Law Commission. Um, yeah, uh, as it says on the slides, implementation is a decision for for government. And obviously, like we said, we're an independent, arm's length body, so we don't lobby the government. Uh, but we might assist them with kind of thought processes if if they require it. Um, and then in addition to that, under a UK protocol adopted in 2009, I think, departments must provide an interim response to any of our final reports within six months of the publication of the report, uh, an interim response, sorry, and then a final response within 12 months. Um, and there's also uh, an obligation on the Lord Chancellor to prepare and lay before Parliament uh, report on the implementation of the various Law Commission proposals. And that report must contain what has been implemented during the year, any decisions to reject proposals, um, what proposals remain unimplemented, and then kind of any other plans for dealing with them. And that, that, that needs to be kind of produced as soon as 
practicable after the end of each year. Um, and there's a similar obligation on the Welsh ministers to, to report annually to the Welsh Parliament as well. Um, and, and like again, again, like it says on the slide, two out of three of our final reports are implemented in whole or in part. So, so take from that what you will, but, but it's just a high percentage of kind of recommendations do go through some form. Uh, I think this is me as well. Um, this is this slide is just about kind of us giving you guys an overview of some of the interesting or some of the projects I should say that we're doing, but I think some of mine are interesting at least. Um, so the one I'm working on is uh, digital assets and that is digital assets in the broadest sense, but it includes things like Word documents, things like domain names, but also things like cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies, I don't I shouldn't say that anymore, crypto assets. So in its broadest sense, a very wide project on digital assets, but we are particularly focused on, on crypto assets and the particular ways in which they operate. Um, we've recently, last week, published an interim update on that project, um, and we expect that we'll come out with our consultation paper in mid-2022. And similarly, last week we've also been doing a project on smart contracts, which again includes all forms of smart contracts. So hybrid contracts, contracts that just use code to implement some terms, and then your true, true kind of smart contract, Vitalik Buster type smart contracts that that run just on on a protocol like like Ethereum, so long as they have a legal element to them. So legal smart contracts, really. Um, and that project has just concluded in our report went out last week if you guys are interested to read it. And then Diana will tell you about the rest of the projects in, in the commercial and common law team. Um, yeah, and the other two projects we've got here are at very opposite stages in their lifetimes. The first is the electronic trade documents project, which is nearing the end. Uh, currently, the team is drafting a bill uh, which is going to be sent to Parliament and the aim of the project is to support the digitization of trade documents like bills of lading and bills of exchange. Uh, and the last project is a project that we have very recently announced and this is possibly one of the projects that uh, you will be on um, if, if you do uh, become an RA at the Law Commission and it's looking at the conflicts of law issues that are raised by all these emerging technologies that Matt was just talking about. And we've also recently, uh, very recently, I think two days ago, announced a project on a review of the Arbitration Act 1996, which uh, you would also potentially be working on. Hi everyone, my name is Austin and I am a research assistant at the Property, Family and Trust Law team, or PFT for short. Um, the main projects that PFT are currently undergoing are on the slides. In the family law aspect of things, we have surrogacy and weddings. Um, both, of those uh, both of those areas of law are governed by fairly old statutes and we are looking at making them more fit for kind of modern life. The third term, the third project here, residential leasehold and common hold is an umbrella term for three separate projects that PFT is undertaking. Um, one is the first is on common hold, which concerns a different form of ownership. Um, second is enfranchisement, which concerns the right to a lease extension, um, for instance. And third is the right to manage, which concerns the right of a leaseholder to take over management functions from the landlord without becoming um, the freehold owner of it. So now I will pass over to Avaya to talk about the criminal law team. Yeah, um, so in criminal law, we have quite a small team actually, but we've got a number of projects like more than what's on here. So the four that I'm talking about today are the first one, hate crime. So uh, hate crime is a project that I'm working on and we're very, very close to publication. So, um, uh, so this project's been going on for about three years. So I think in terms of all the projects, I guess they take a number of years and it depends on what stage you get to see that for the brief time that you're at the law com. So I've gotten to see just the, uh, I've gotten to see post consultation analysis where we've been working on the final report and 
thing and working on its implementation uh, in terms of uh, in terms of um, impact assessments and other things that we do at our end. Um, the second project that is taking, making and sharing intimate images without consent. So this is a project that both of these actually hit crime and IIA. They're both more high profile than we're used to in the LawCom. So this has been something new to me as well as new to the team. Uh, so IIA is currently in its consultation analysis stage. So we've got a number of responses uh, from stakeholders and it's about us looking at what we think of each particular uh, of the input that we get from these different stakeholders and from the public in uh, uh, from the public and certain independent victims themselves. Um, so it's quite an interesting stage of the project. Corporate criminal liability is similar in the sense that it's a similar stage of consultation analysis, but I guess it's different in the sense that this is more um, our stakeholders and more organizations more in a way that we're uh, in a way where uh, in, in a way that we're sort of directed by a few stakeholders rather than the many that we got, for example, for hate crime, where we got about 2,400. So it very much depends on the type of project and uh, the kinds of stakeholders uh, as to what your analysis is like and what your job and role here are like. And contempt of court. Uh, so this is at the implementation stage in the sense that we are working on drafting term, drafting instructions to uh, parliamentary council and working on that with them. So it's quite an interesting stage of the project to be able to see, well, uh, to be able to see drafting in and of itself. Uh, so these, uh, so at that stage of the project, uh, the people that are working on it, it's, it gives you a lot of um, skills, either as barristers or solicitors to work on and to take from that. I'll pass over now to Matt. Matt, sorry, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I knew that would catch me out at some point. So I, I'm going to talk about the public law and the law in Wales team. And you can see the three uh, projects on there. Uh, all of them are coming up to the report. And in the public law team, we look at how the uh, state and government interacts with uh, people that isn't that isn't criminal behaviour. And so devolved tribunals in Wales, that's been looking at what is a tribunal in Wales and tidying up the law around that. Regulating coal tip safety in Wales, that was a project to do with a, a disaster that was in Wales, I think around 50 years ago, and people sadly lost their lives. And it's following uh, all the mining in Wales that there's these disused tips uh, all over Wales that people now own, but they don't realise that there actually are coal tips on their land and they're dangerous. And so we've been looking at created, creating a register of where these coal tips are and assessing their safety. And then I'm on the automated vehicles project, which has been a, a huge project for three years. I've actually been in an automated vehicle in Greenwich in London, uh, which is really good. And whilst it is public law and we're establishing a or recommending a regulatory scheme to deploy AVs on roads in Great Britain and make sure they're safe. We also look at different areas. So we've been looking at uh, criminal law and so that when uh, a driver is in a vehicle and that vehicle is driving itself, it will be uh, the person in the in the car won't be criminally liable, say if it runs through a red light. Um, and it. we've also looked at civil liability and how uh, automated vehicles are marketed and it's just been a really interesting project to look all around the world at how uh, these vehicles, well, first of all, how they're being developed, what they will look like, we don't really know, what features uh, will they have, but also how different jurisdictions have uh, dealt with these new issues that have come up with them. And so how are they dealing with it in America and just other jurisdictions around the world, um, France, Germany. And so it's just been a really interesting uh, project to be involved with. And because of these three have all got to the report stage, like we said earlier, if you join uh, our team, there'll be lots of new work to get involved with once the 14th programme has been confirmed. So as we mentioned earlier, the Law Commission recruits up to 18 research assistants per year, and they're divided across the different teams, uh, depending on the need and the projects that are coming up. 
It's a one year contract that starts in September. And when you apply, you apply to one of the four teams uh, set out on the slide there. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Abaya just to talk about the different stages of projects and what research assistants do. You just switched the slide, Matt. Uh, so I think I covered this somewhat when I was doing the stages of the project already, but um, at the pre-consultation stage, like I said, we start off with ex researching the existing law in terms of discussing amongst ourselves and figuring out ways uh, people at the Commission as to what the issues are that are pertinent to the terms of reference we've received. We identify the problems and somehow like options for reform. In a sense, uh, initial ideas we either get either from academic research or from uh, priority stakeholders that we have initial engagement with. Uh, so this is also a part of the research that we do, figuring out who our priority stakeholders are for each project and making those making those relationships. So they, you know, give us enough input and we stay with that for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the uh, project. So at this stage, for certain projects. Um, we also might have advisory groups. So advisory groups are also something that we decide at the pre-consultation stage. So as a research assistant, I'm uh, so you work with stakeholder management. That is, you start developing these relationships with the uh, with stakeholders, and you basically become sort of a point guy for everyone to ask. Uh, you know, uh, to set up meetings, roundtables, symposiums, and things like that for the consultation stage. Um, Preparation of the consultation paper happen so at the consultation stage for the prep of that we first obviously start off with consultations. That is, we have those symposiums and roundtables to discuss what uh, opinions might be, and then sometimes research assistants help in drafting the consultation papers themselves from the uh, from any engagement that we've had uh, that feeds into that, uh, and then we help with these consultation events, like I said, and then uh, the consultation stage itself lasts for about. Um, three months, that is after our publication of the interim report. So in those three months, uh, you're just trying to publicize, uh, figuring out ways to help publicize the report. Um, so I can say that, for example, certain projects, putting them just on the BBC or things like that have been enough. Certain other projects, you need to figure out, um, you know, how to target that and that also falls to research assistance sometimes. But largely at any of these stages, it is about the initiatives that you take. Uh, because people at the law com are pretty open to letting you engage as much as you want, provided that you take it on. Uh, and then at the report stage, uh, again, you from the consultation paper itself and from the public responses that we've received, either from organizations or individuals, that feeds into the final report and you could help draft the final report itself if you're there at that stage, helping make those decisions as to what you're actually going to recommend. That's brilliant. I got asked literally my first week here um, what I thought about a particular issue and it ended up on the final report and I'd been here, you know, a few weeks, but I did the research. I'm not, I mean, you do the research and it's obviously like substantiated, but what I mean is people are very open to new ideas and it's a very, um, non-hierarchical approach to working in the team. And again, at, after the report is published, you might have to draft instructions to Parliamentary Council, depending on how it goes in Parliament. Uh, and this, again, you'll help with, you'll help with publication, printing, literally from the smallest admin tasks to the biggest tasks there are, just depending on how much initiative you take and what stage the project is at. Hi everyone, so I'm going to briefly cover a day in the life of a research assistant. In truth, a day in the life of a research assistant is incredibly varied and the type of work you do will almost certainly depend on what stage your project is at, which does mean that the, the work that I do will vary compared to what other RAs are doing. Um, but even for myself, there is no one day in the life of a research assistant that is the same. Different tasks will always constantly crop up and you might also sometimes have the opportunity to get involved with other projects in the commission. 
Generally, however, your job will be a mix of legal research, legal analysis, policy analysis, alongside general administrative tasks. So Matt, if you can move to the next slide. Covering the reasons for becoming a research assistant, the PowerPoint slides gives kind of the five most general and most common um, reasons why you would want to apply to be a research assistant, and those are also true for myself. Um, personally, I wanted to become a research assistant because I wanted an insight into the lawmaking perspective by working within government, even as someone who eventually wants to go into practice, legal practice, um, the RA role struck me as a really unique opportunity to work on a technical area of law, but to view it from a policy and legal reform perspective. Secondly, the role also inevitably provides you with the transferable skills that you that is necessary and good for legal practice, such as legal research, presentation, written communication skills. So I'll pass back over to Abaya, who will talk more about why she wanted to become a research assistant. Yeah, um, I guess there's similar reasons, but also I've always been particularly interested in criminal law and I've worked on criminal law in various different ways, like in tribunals, uh, just doing research for uh, academics or working in law clinics and things like that and many pupillages. And I thought the thing that struck me at that time for me was that it didn't feel like I was part of an impact as much as it does at the Law Commission. So I think here the fact that regardless of how little I probably control the outcomes of these large projects, there's still something I'm doing every day that's uh, where you work with colleagues that are just as engaged and people that are really passionate about what they do. So it gives it gives me a sense of job satisfaction I haven't had anywhere else that I've worked so far. Uh, and that was really important for me and that was a reason to apply for a policy type of job to work for government for example uh, work for government the way that Austin just said and the civil service employment conditions I mean it wasn't a reason that I applied but now that I have it I realize that it's uh, there's a lot of perks to being on the inside um, in sense even if it's uh, if I want to apply to pupillage next there's a lot of resources I have being a research assistant that I wouldn't have had you know, in any other kind of job. Uh, these are these are access to people that are very willing to help, even if they're really senior, um, you know, relationships that you can build, uh, personal experiences that you can gain from. And people, I was asked on my very first week, um, what I, because it is a one year placement, so everybody's very aware of the fact that you're using it as a stepping stone to your career or, you know, that you need to go somewhere from here. So I was asked very first week what it is that I wanted to do after that. And I was put into projects or given tasks that, would help me do that. So people are very aware and people know about opportunities that I wouldn't have known if I wasn't doing this job. So now I'm going to talk about the application process and then we'll hear from our, our lawyers who will explain it in more detail. Applications will open in January 2022 and are made online uh, through the Ministry of Justice uh, website. Our guide for applicants will be published in uh, within the next two weeks and we will be placed on the website. I can't stress how important it is to read this and then read it uh, again. It contains so much useful information about what's expected at each stage and really just makes the process uh, a lot clearer. So I would really recommend reading that and just understanding what's expected before you even try to start answering questions and thinking about the application. There are academic requirements and they are that you must have completed two years of legal studies by September 2022. So the conventional route for that is to have done a, a law degree or a, doing a combined degree where two of uh, those years were in law or an alternative route is to have done uh, the GDL and then a postgraduate master's study and then uh, the final option is to have done a year's postgraduate and then the bar course or um, the LPC. However, if you do use that option, you need to explain how you've got the requisite legal skills uh, from other knowledge or experience. And the reason we ask for that is, as we've all explained, talking about our projects, different areas of law uh, can come up and you're required to research and think about these wide ranging issues that you do need that base knowledge of different uh, areas of law to be able to come at that and really 
grapple with the issues that we're dealing with and bring about a really good law reform. We also require either a first class degree or a high two one degree with elements of first class work. And if you do have any concerns about these academic requirements, uh, read the guide for applicants, which sets out all of them in detail with examples. And if you're still struggling to see uh, whether you will make those requirements, please do get in touch with us. The closing date for applications is Monday the 31st of January uh, 2022. So this is the application process. Uh, first of all, you'll complete a online application form. This is where you upload um, a CV and answer questions to do with what we call a success profile. You'll then set a, a situational judgment test, where, which is just a test to see how you'd respond to situations as a research assistant. That grey line there uh, indicates where a, a paper sift is undertaken and you'll find out whether you are being invited to an interview. If you are successful, then you'll be asked to complete a written test for your particular team. You'll then be given some pre-reading uh, for your interview and you'll have your interview with your chosen team. Uh, we're going to discuss each of these stages uh, in more detail, so uh, you'll hear more from the lawyers about what's involved at each different part. And just to mention that we're an equal opportunity as employer. So if you do consider you've got a disability and you meet our minimum criteria, so that's to say you meet the academic requirements and you meet the uh, minimum score in the situational judgment test, we'll guarantee you an interview. So I'll hand over to Matt now to talk uh, about the paper application. Hey, everybody. Um... I feel like I'm qualified to talk about this because I only recently joined in March, so I had to go through the lawyer equivalent of this process. And then when I started, I also had to, I was also involved in the research assistant recruiting process, so I got to see it from both sides. Um, so the first point I think is on, on this slide is that the the CV is in in, in a just a prescribed format and is institution blind, so um it, it kind of limits the way in which you can kind of tailor your cv but that's good because it means that kind of kind of candidates are equal and and we obviously recruit on an institution blind basis um and, and then the form itself is important because it kind of builds up a success profile for you guys and uh, and you can see all of these um these criteria listed here i don't necessarily need to, to read them out to you um and they're obviously covered in the form themselves but what i would say is that don't just think about your legal research and your legal skills when you're doing your form, just because this is like a law commission role. I think actually the way there are different teams have different ways of weighting grades, but each of these is important. And if you don't hit your all of your success profiles, you're not going to get the better overall score. So obviously the legal research and the legal skills are super important but everything else is important as well and we're not just looking for kind of legal robots we're looking for rounded individuals and know everybody says that but but it actually comes through um particularly it came through to me after i'd done my forms when i was actually reviewing other people's forms and it's just something to think about because i don't think i did my forms particularly well in that respect um so i don't know how i got through but anyway that's that's that would be one of my kind of insider tips and I'm not now I've got to give some more insider tips. Um, but I think the idea behind this um, slide is not that we're suggesting that you be shop assistants um, and use that as your experience because it's probably, it, I don't know, it might depend how you write it, I guess, but it might not be the best experience. Um, although, really, the point of this slide is to say any experience is useful. Part of, part of the form is like, in itself a test as to how you present yourself, what teamwork, communication, working under pressure and leadership skills you've shown in whatever area, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in law. Um, and actually that comes through both in the forms and also it's something to think about for the interviews as well, because I saw people have kind of better on paper examples or kind of more prestigious examples or whatever it might be whatever you might normally think of as better example but then because it was explained in a worse way or not quite drawing out the skills that we might have been looking for 
those people didn't do as well as other people might have done with a more kind of everyday type example. So don't just think about the examples you're choosing. Don't just think about kind of um, the ideas that you're the ideas of what you've done think about how you convey that and think about what the question is actually asking you to do that would be my tip for, for filling in the form in that way and i get to talk to you about stars so um, that's pretty exciting. So uh, following on from Matt, when you're filling in a form, it can be a little bit uh, daunting to have to come up with how to convey like the best experience of yourself and show you know, all the talent that you do have. And it can sometimes be a bit tricky. So the STAR method is a, is a good lens through which to think about the experience you've got and how you might be able to share it and explain it to others in a way that really uh, you know, hits all the right buttons so STAR stands for situational task and then um, so identifying, you know, what the issue is, what the task you were working on was and then an action that you took that demonstrates, you know, the particular um, skill that we're looking for and then the result. And so it basically puts your skill in context. So Matt was saying um, earlier, you know, we've got questions about teamwork or about leadership and it really pays off to think about these things in advance, obviously, when you're filling in the form, but then also if you're in an interview um, to think about particular specific examples from your life where you can demonstrate that skill because um, one of the things I've noticed uh, where people sometimes have a bit of trouble is if they say yes I've got leadership skills but then they stay really abstract so they will be like oh um, yeah I take control of situations and that you know doesn't take you very far um, yeah I'm good at teamwork I enjoy working with people but if you can say oh like in the example on the slide you know, something went wrong with the tech. And so we had to deal with like a, a really big manual task and we had to organize it. And I suggested this particular method of tackling it and we did it together. And the result was that we managed to, you know, complete the task on time. That just gives a lot more color. Uh, so basically it, the way I think about it, it just sort of helps you shine. Um, and you know, I don't know if you can remember it like with Rihanna, shine like a diamond, like when you're doing your interview, uh, like and preparing for your, um, you know, like your application form and make it a bit more fun for yourself. Because remember, another person is reading it. So if you can be um, a bit more uh, individual and showing something that is really striking about yourself, it does help your application because you've got so many to deal with that. Um, yeah, I think being um, real and interesting um, about how you explain yourself uh, goes, a, goes a really long way. And it's also useful to think about things to avoid. So you've got the plus side on the one hand of things you know that really make you shine and then you've got the things that really dim your light. So one of them is if you've got typos in there. Obviously at the Law Commission we do a lot of written work. You know we're really known for our publications. So if you do typos that doesn't reflect well on you. Huh? I even used a reflective word there. I didn't uh, mean to do it but um, but basically it won't be a good thing right because that's our actual task is to make sure that we try and be um, as precise and careful, you know, with our publication. So if your application uh, doesn't demonstrate that, it doesn't instill that much confidence. You know, that said, we're all human and, you know, we're not going to strike you down just because you have like one typo in there. But if it's replete with mistakes or typos, then obviously that would uh, not really speak very highly of your ability to, you know, uh, detect errors and that kind of thing, which is important for the role. Um, and um, just also with the deadlines that Matt was telling us about before, give yourself enough time. Um, it would be just such a pity for you to start, uh, you know, on this form and then you leave yourself right to the last minute and then there's some sort of tech problem. And I have had people contact us and I remember, you know, that they maybe were not able to upload their form on time. And it's just really difficult because we've got to be fair to everyone and you know really have a meaningful deadline but then um, if you just leave it to midnight um, and you say your connection goes down it just it just makes it harder so like try and avoid that so if you possibly can i know we all have so many different uh, balls to juggle but if you can give yourself more time it's really worth it so try and not leave it right to the last minute because sometimes also the site might have trouble, you know, it might crash, you know, like with Black Friday now, you might have experienced it. Sometimes you really wanted to get that thing, but um, it sort of slipped away. So don't let this opportunity slip away. Try and give yourself enough time. And uh, with that, I will hand over to Austin to tell us about the situational judgment test, I believe. 
Oh, I'll just quickly add before we hand over to Austin that we really value uh, Welsh language skills at the Law Commission, especially in the Public Law and Law in Wales team. So if you are uh, fluent in Welsh and you are a Welsh speaker, please state that on your application form uh, and your level of proficiency. Moving on to the Situational Judgment Test or SJT, this is something that we are introducing this year and it's new to the application process which will take place after your initial application. Um, the Law Commission has introduced this to ensure that the selection procedure is fair and open to all candidates. The SJT asks you questions based on scenarios which you're likely to face um, in your role as a research assistant and is meant to measure how you respond to real life situations. And your responses are uh, kind of measured against the the civil service behaviors that are on the slide. So seeing the bigger picture, delivering at pace, making effective decisions, working together, communicating and influencing. Um, after you submit your application, everyone is invited to sit the situational judgment test and candidates who pass the SJT will then have their application sifted. Yeah, and then the next stage of the process is a written test. So again, like it says in the slides, if you're selected for interview, um, a written test or a research exercise will be emailed to you. Uh, you can have a choice of dates on which to, to complete the, the test. Um, there's no background knowledge required. It's 1,750 words. And I think you get, yeah, you must get six hours to, to do the test um, and email it back. Um, I think for the just for the test quickly, um, one thing that we I would suggest is that um, if you're writing kind of legal legal analysis or you're you're quoting or things like that, you might not want to kind of copy and paste from judgments even if there's a judgment included in the text don't kind of re re copy and paste in that way kind of try and um add your own analysis to it uh, that would be one of my my tips for that um and then in terms of the interview process again it varies on the team but you might have to do some legal research in advance um <laughs> the tips is research basic interview questions and that is true but again don't just think about the kind of the legal aspects of things. Think about all of your answers carefully and think about how you might demonstrate all of the skills that have been tested in the rest of the application form and, and perhaps kind of prepare answers or at least think through how you might answer questions around that. That said, on top of that, I, I would suggest that if you have been emailed a test or if you know what team you're going into or you know the work of the team that you might be doing, it probably makes some sense to read around that subject because we'll be interested in people who are one interested in that area and who two kind of understand that area. So, so, so again, that would be that would be helpful. And then, uh, yeah, look at the videos on our website for for additional kind of tips and practices. Practice is a really good one because I think that people underestimate how weird and how hard interviews are in some ways. And actually practicing that just helps you to to, to logically organise your thoughts and also to present them in a way that is understandable by others. And if you do that a few times, I think it will improve your, your performance on the day. And just um, to add to what Matt said, in terms of do's and don'ts, I think probably the aspect that I find makes people stand out a lot is if they've done research about the kinds of projects that their team is doing. Um, so we heard before from uh, Matt and Avaya um, um, a bit like about sort of different projects, for example, that their teams are doing in criminal or in the public law team, uh, for example. And so if you're applying to those teams, I think it pays off you know really really well to know what those projects are maybe read if they've published something already have a look at it just be aware of what the issues are the kinds of stakeholders it just shows an interest in the organization and also it makes sure that people understand that you don't have some idyllic abstract idea of the law commission like that you're actually practically engaging with it i think that's probably the biggest thing i would say um, and echoing what matt said about practice um, to really, rather than trying to cover absolutely everything, 
Um, I would really suggest that you pick some top points, you know, that, that you want to put across and try and be really clear about them. Um, the written form is very different to the spoken form. I think when we talk to each other, uh, it really pays off to try and be a bit more simple and not go into too many caveats and too many uh, specificities. Can, you can get a bit lost um, and you don't want that. Um, and I'll try and follow my own advice in the sense also try not to speak for too long, like, you know, look for that kind of feedback from people. Um, otherwise, it can happen that you go off on a bit of a tangent and especially with virtual stuff, it's quite hard for people to interject and guide you. In real life, I found that, you know, I always if I see someone's going on a bit off on a tangent, I will really try and interject and interject and bring them back to something that's, you know, more relevant to the interview question and will help them get better points. I think it's a bit harder to do that um, in the virtual setting. So I would probably opt for maybe slightly shorter answers if you're doing it virtually and just, you know, looking for that feedback before you continue on. So you just have that um, idea that you're sure that you're doing yourself, you know, the best uh, possible service in, in answering your question. And with that, I'll hand over to our Master of Ceremonies, Matt, uh, to do some Q&A. Thank you. Matt, I think you're on mute again. God, it's happened to me twice now. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that, everyone. I hope you enjoyed hearing from uh, all of my colleagues. Well, we, now we'll do the Q&A, so if you do have any, please post in the Q&A chat function. We'll probably answer questions for around 10 minutes, and so uh, I'll just get started straight away. One of the first ones was if you have uh, international experience, should you uh, use that on the form? Definitely, I'd say use any experience uh, you have. For me, I after university, I went to travel in Australia and New Zealand and whilst I was over there um, worked for the government and in private practice and so I spoke about how that experience made me look at the law of England and Wales in a different way by um, practicing law in New Zealand and seeing how the law was slightly different now and it just made me think think about things in a different way so use any experience whether it's within the UK um, or from somewhere else. Do you want to read out some uh, questions, Austin, if there are any that you've published? Yes, should I should I read them out? Yeah, um, go on. So are RA positions available for international students slash candidates? Yeah, so the answer to that one is that uh, yes, the Law Commission can't uh, sponsor any visas, but if you can work in the UK, then it's, it's open to um, anyone. You just need to show that you have two years of legal studies and that uh, you you'll need to demonstrate that that those studies are to do with the British legal system and, and you understand how uh, the law all works here. But if you do have any questions on that, send the question and um, email us at uh, it's recruitment at lawcommission.gov.uk. Uh, that's on the next slide that you can take down, but get in touch if you if you are concerned about that. But yeah, we are open to international students. Another common question is, are you able to apply for the RA position before graduating from your LLB? Yeah, that's fine. As long as by the time uh, you reach September 2022, you will have met the minimum requirements. Would working as an RA count towards the work experience required for the SQE? Uh, I don't I don't think so. Uh, you could email to check, but my impression is that it wouldn't. And also, although the commission is independent, are employees considered civil servants? <laughs> you can answer that if you want, Austin. Yes, the answer to that. <laughs> um, let, sorry, I'm going to have to look for more questions and to publish. No problem. I've, I've got one here. It says okay. the public law in Wales. Are you only slash mostly looking for Welsh speakers? Um, I'm doing a public law LLM, but not a Welsh speaker. No, we're looking for uh, all kinds of candidates from whatever background you're from. It's just that if you are a Welsh speaker, then please make that known uh, because it's uh, really useful in our team. We do a lot of work with uh, the Welsh government and for the Wales Advisory Committee and quite often we translate our reports uh, into Welsh. So if you have those skills, it would definitely benefit us, but that doesn't exclude those who can't speak Welsh. Um, me personally, I can't speak Welsh. 
Another question that we got was, is there a way to progress from being an RA? And how long would you spend as an RA before being eligible for a promotion? The answer to that is that the RA job is usually for a fixed term contract for one year. Um, there is a possibility to stay on a second year if um, depending on the resources of the commission, but um, in general, the general expectation is that RAs are at the law commission for a maximum of one or two years. Uh, there's a question here that says, would you be at a disadvantage if you apply in your third and final year of law as opposed to applying uh, post-graduation? Uh, there's no right answer to this and it's it just depends on your experience and it's really how you explain on the uh, written application form that you have the skills that we're looking for and so if you only get those skills having done um, a master's then so be it but I wouldn't discourage you from applying straight after university uh, there are some people that have joined us straight after university and if you don't get it on this occasion you can always reapply um, a year later once you have gained more experience there are some practical questions, I guess, that I can quickly deal with. Um, so the hours of operation um, for a research assistant, you work on the flexible time um, um, scheme as part of um, a civil servant and you are expected to work 37 hours a week and the core hours are 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday to Friday and you can work flexibly around that. A question about the situation with COVID, um, the answer to that is I don't think there's any definite answer around that at the moment. The Law Commission currently is working flexibly. Um, you can go into the office, you can work in the office, or you can work from home. For how long that will continue, I'm afraid I haven't got the answer for that. <laughs> uh, there's a question here and it says if uh, how would you show interest in the 14th programme if it's not released until later in the year? What I would say is if you follow uh, the Law Commission on Twitter, uh, we're constantly talking about new projects that are up and coming. So I know uh, that Diana explained some new projects in her team, but we also uh, talk about different events and uh, different things that are going on in the legal sphere. So whilst the 14th programme won't be confirmed till next year, you can talk about the issues that are kind of live uh, for the different teams and ongoing at the minute. So even in, even in the public law team, uh, as automated vehicles is coming to a uh, close, that doesn't mean that's it. There's going to be no more work on that. There may be work uh, in the future to do with uh, different types of vehicles and new technologies. So if you are interested in that, then just explain that. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to know what the projects are going to be. You can talk about our previous work um, or just work in an area to do with one of the teams that you find interesting and why. Have you got any more questions, Austin? Yeah, um, there are a couple kind of there. Are, I saw a couple questions that were talking about or asking about what um, kind of jobs RAs go into after their time at the Law Commission or slash career jobs. Um, and there's a real broad mix, um, but I think the majority is quite common for RAs to spend a year or two at the Law Commission and then either move on to a training contract at a solicitor firm or I, th I would say more commonly um, pupillage at the bar. There are also research assistants who go on to work in policy or other parts of government. Uh, there's been quite a few general questions just to do with how many applicants. I think the average for the last three years is around uh, six or seven hundred. And then just some questions about um, working online. Like we, as the Commission at the minute, we are um, working online. We're kind of hybrid. Sometimes we go in depending on what meetings we have, but we are working online and um, just as we're having this online event. And you can expect that the uh, application process and if you're invited to interview will be online unless you hear any different. Have you got any yep. other? Uh... Yeah, uh, there were some general questions about um, applying to teams. Um, the, the guide um, for research assistance will be published later in early December, as Matt mentioned, but you can you will have to identify the one team that you would like to apply for. 
Um, there are also kind of follow follow up questions on whether or not you get to choose the project that you get put on once um, once you've chosen your team. Um, I think for me personally, I was asked at interview if I had any preference for the projects that I would be on, but ultimately that is a decision that will be made by the lawyers and the team. So. Yeah, yeah, and that was the exact exact same in the public law team. Uh, I said at interview I was interested in automated vehicles and luckily when I got the call, that was the project um, that I was given. What I'll do is I'll just put the next slide on, which has our contact details. And then I think we'll just do one more question each, Austin, and then um, we can wrap up. Do you want to do yours first? Sorry, I'm just looking quickly looking through the questions. Um, I'll just instead, I'll just make a general kind of more administrative point, um, which is that after this live event is over, we are aiming to upload the recording of the live event onto the Law Commission website. We've also got a lot of questions about whether or not these slides will be shared with all of you who are here and we'll try our best a name to circulate a copy of the slides to you afterwards as well. Yeah, and just looking through, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions to do with the academic requirements, so I'll just repeat them uh, just to be clear. So it's two years of substantive legal studies and the usual route for that is to have done a, an undergraduate law degree. If you did a different um, degree, then the alternative would be to have undertaken two years of postgraduate, whether that's um, a GDL and then uh, just a further master's in law um, or some other sort of combination. But this, all of this will be explained in the guide for applicants that will be published within the next two weeks and will be placed on our website. And if you're still unsure, uh, the contact details are there on the slide for you to get in touch. Uh, another important thing to mention is that if you do have questions directed towards the research assistant, the research assistants, then in January, we're doing a, a scheme where you can send in your email by the 2nd uh, of January with just your questions and which team you want to direct them to. And then we can organise a telephone call with a research assistant in that team that will take place on the 6th and 7th of uh, January, where you'll be able to talk to them and ask them um, about the role and get your questions answered. And so I think that's all we have time for. So I just want to say thank you very much uh, for joining the event. We hope you found uh, it useful and best of luck uh, with your applications. And we uh, wish you all a great rest of your uh, evening. Thanks very much for joining.